everyone, today we're going to talk about water activity and its implications for food processing and food quality. This just happens to be the model of water activity meter that I use in my lab and in my teaching on any given day. And it, uh, I don't want to show preference to one meter or another, but um, the nice thing about water activity is it's a pretty straightforward technique with a lot of very powerful implications in food safety. So after watching this video, you will be able to determine the water activity of a food product. Now, again, I can't physically hold your hand and walk you through how to use a machine, but I can strongly encourage you to read up the manuals and you'll have the scientific understanding of how water activity functions. You'll also see that it's pretty straightforward to do. You'll understand the mathematical principles behind water activity calculation. You'll be able to identify appropriate methods to modify water activity in a product and think about the colligative properties and how it uh, interacts with net moisture for what we call a moisture sorption isotherm. Um, you'll be able to identify appropriate targets for water activity for microbial control. Again, We'll talk about the logistics of performing water activity measurements using standard equipment. And again, the fun of teaching using online videos is that I'll walk you through the, the process, but in the end, you're going to have to identify what is the machine available to you and read the manual specific to that machine, but it's not too complicated with this. And then last but not least, we'll talk about the mechanics in those machines, what's called dew point calculations that are done in those water activity meters. So what is water activity? Well, it's the availability of water to interact and participate in chemical and biological reactions. In many cases, food products have water activity targets as part of the quality control or food safety management that's necessary to ensure that those products don't spoil or don't promote the outgrowth of bacteria. And water activity is really linked to how much the water is bound up in a food. And so in some foods, water is bound in cells. Think of fruits and vegetables, think of meat. And it's physically partitioned within the cell membranes or the cell walls, but it's only partly bound. In other cases, you could have macromolecular binding, such as the use of gels, gelatin or pectin or glucomannan. Some of these large macromolecules are able of creating networks that can bind up water. But again, it's not quite the same as where you have molecular level binding. This is where you have the colligative properties of the solutes that are binding up that water and its availability to participate in chemical or biological reactions. And so these are all considerations that we take into effect when thinking about water activity. Colligative properties, I have another video where I'll be talking about how we modify colligative properties, but Usually how we see this in food products is where we're changing the salt or sugar concentration in a food because salts and sugars are really good at binding up water into unavailable forms and that changes the water activity in very quick fashion. So here's some math for you. Water activity is expressed as A with a subscript W, water activity. And it is the vapor pressure of water from the sample that you're analyzing divided by the vapor pressure of pure water. And it is expressed, as you can tell by the math here, it is expressed in a unitless dimension. So it doesn't have grams or centimeters cubed or watts per whatever, um, it, is, it is a unitless expression and it is always going to be expressed as one or a decimal. And so you will see water activities getting like 0 
0.99 or sometimes you will see products that have a, a water activity of 1.0 but you will never see a product that has a water activity of 2 because you can never have a vapor pressure of water in a food product that's going to be greater than the vapor pressure of water. So it's going to become vapor pressure of water divided by vapor pressure of water which equals 1. Now that said, most food products are going to be in some bracketed ranges and we'll, we'll see a table in a couple slides here. Now, when I say water activity, I'm not saying moisture content and I, I have a different video that talks about moisture content. Moisture content is where we're looking at the gravimetric um, content of evaporatable substances within that food product. Water activity, you could have a lot of water in a food product, but it could all be bound up in um, colligative property based uh, binding such that that water isn't available for reactions. What we have very commonly, so again, water activity is expressed in unitless values up to 1.0 as our maximum. Bacteria, for the most part, grow in the range of 0.88 or so to 1.0. Bacteria typically are going to be growing in biological systems. So our, if, if you were to take the water activity of me, cut, cut my arm open or cut my hand open, my water activity is pretty close to one. Bacteria thrive in that space. Now there are some yeasts that are capable of growing at slightly water activity and some fungi or molds that are capable of growing at even lower water activities. We get to that threshold of 0 0.6 and very few things are capable of growing from a microbial spoilage perspective. But that said, pulling water activity lower doesn't necessarily increase quality. You pull it too low and you start to lose other quality attributes, such as you, you start, uh, water to a certain ex extent contributes to crispness or caking or um, the collapse of food products in some cases where you need that water bound in the food product to provide structure. Browning reactions, so caramelization and Maillard reaction are very much linked to water activity and available water so that you have this peak of browning reactions at 0 0.6, but they reduce at lower water activities and they reduce at higher water activities. And lipid oxidation, again, there's a sweet spot in this 0.3 to 0.5 range where lipid oxidation reduces to its lowest point, but pull it lower and lipid oxidation increases, or pull it higher and lipid oxidation increases. Down here it's going to be because water actually be has a coating effect on some of the lipid systems within foods and now you are losing that protective effect and just direct exposure to oxygen whereas up here you are having additional enzyme activity and oxidation could be occurring from lipolysis in the food product under enzymatic conditions. So typical water activities that we see in foods, fresh meats and fish we're pushing really, really high, close to that uh, theoretical water activity of water itself. Most bread, when it's fresh, has a high water activity. And think about the shelf life of many of these products. Again, we're pushing lower and lower and the less likelihood of these products to be spoiling on their own. We hit this 0.8 to 0.6 and we are. this is where we're seeing really only very, what are called xerophilic or osmophilic yeasts and molds being able to grow because, again, these organisms have to be adapted to be able to free up some of the water that is otherwise linked on a molecular level to the solutes, the sugars or salts, or other solutes within the system. Now, here's a table of microorganisms. Most, most bacteria that are pathogenic again are growing in very high water activity environments because again they're, they're, they're going to be pathogenic in biological systems and most living breathing mammals which are where the pathogens that we see most these are going to be in those biological ranges. 
most other uh, bacteria are able to grow in that range where we're once we're hitting 0 0.88 we're starting to hit the limit at which bacteria are able to grow but again there's always exceptions to the rule and so you can't just go out there and say well Amy showed me a PowerPoint and it said 0.88 was the cutoff. No, there are other considerations. Think about pH, think about total moisture content, think about oxygen, lots of different reasons. And so again, you want to go back to some validated information, either from a processing authority, a government resource, or some sort of blue ribbon study from an industry group that says here is an appropriate water activity that's going to prevent microbial growth or pathogen growth in the product that you're working on. What do water activity meters look like? Well, they come in a wide variety of different shapes and sizes, but typically from an industry standard, we're seeing a very small, approximately three centimeters in diameter plastic dish, and usually with a small lid that goes on it. These are then placed into the reader device or the reader device is placed on top in the case of this, what, uh, what they call a pocket, which is a pocket water activity meter. These are very common for quality inspectors who need a, a device that can be easily portable and taken out onto the manufacturing floor. But you'll notice on this pocket here, for example, it only has two decimal places, where some of these other larger meters are going up to three, or in this case, the Aqualab up to four decimal places of accuracy. That said, if we go back to this table, in general, within regulatory limits, we're seeing them expressed at two decimal points. And so, Take that into consideration when you are purchasing a device because something that, like this with less accuracy is going to cost a little bit less, but it may not give you the level of um, accuracy and control that you need. So you may require more decimal points for really strict process control. It is the sort of thing where you do likely need to buy something. In some of my other videos, you may have seen me discuss opportunities for using a bootstrapping approach and what can you do with minimal technology to be able to approximate the sorts of analytical results. In this case, it is worth the money because of the importance that it is played. Yes, there are old school methods where you can take um, different concentrations of, of salt and weigh the amount of, of humidity or hygroscopicity of a sample when put into an environment with a saturated salt solution, but it's really not practical for most food manufacturers to be doing that. This is the sort of thing where you are either going to buy a meter or you are going to find a lab that has a meter and you can send out samples for advice uh, on a contract basis. So how do you do it? Well, you're going to take that little sample cup and fill it about half full. You don't want it to have it overfilled because that sensor on the, to on the top, in the case on, in, in the pocket, on the bottom of the device, you do not want the food sample to be in, in contact with that sensor. It can mess up the ability of that sensor to read accurately. And so avoid overfilling the sample cup so that you don't muck up your machine. Be patient. Some of the meters will take some time to equilibrate. We'll talk about the mechanics of equilibration in a moment. And there are calibration discs available for calibrating each of these different units. Those calibration discs, as I mentioned, are filled with a saturated salt solution of different, um, different salts. And those different salts, when in a saturated solution, will have very precise water activity cutoffs. And so there are ways of calibrating these devices. Again, go back to the user manual of the device that you've ended up selecting for your analysis. And most manufacturers anymore are posting their user manuals online. So do not be afraid of Googling it, looking it up on your search engine of choice and finding those manuals to identify how do you calibrate and how do you use it better. 
how do these meters work? Well, most of them are using what's called a dew point detection system. And so if I can summarize it using my fun little diagram here, imagine inside that device there's a mirror. Well, there is a mirror, and that mirror is slowly but surely on this thermostat changing temperature. And that mirror, just like when you're taking a shower in your washroom and the mirror fogs up, what we're hitting is the dew point. The level of relative humidity is going to eventually condense on that mirror depending on the relative humidity in the, in the closed atmosphere around this food sample and the temperature of the mirror. So that mirror is on a thermostat and the temperature slowly, slowly, slowly changes. Meanwhile, there's a little light sensor. And so it is pinging off a beam of light onto the mirror and the mirror is then reflecting it back onto a sensor and the sensor says, okay, the mirror is still clear. The temperature of this sample as compared to the room temperature hasn't hit the dew point. But bit by bit by bit, it's measuring the, the temperature of the atmosphere around and it's measuring the temperature of the mirror. Bit by bit, the temperature is going to ramp down to the point that, that mirror gets condensation. On it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to draw condensation. So I just, I made it look like it was uh, marred up and the light that's coming from the emitter gets scattered and the light sensor down here then says, aha, thermostat, that was the temperature at which the dew point was hit and it will stop the device and you now know the water, er, it will go through its own algorithm to identify what the water activity was based off of the relative humidity off of this sample. Now, it is going through using a psychrometric table to be able to do that calculation. And we will do a different presentation at a different time to talk about psychrometrics and it, the relative humidity. But in general, going back to those water activity measures, it will give you out that number and that's all you need to do. You do not need to do any further analysis. You take that number and that will be recorded in your control document or it will be part of your product specification if you're doing product development. Short and simple. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.